Hey everyone, Noah Zerbe here. This is one in a series of short videos on topics in international relations. This video deals with the Cold War and nuclear politics during that period. Other videos in this series address theoretical and historical topics in international relations. So let's get started. The nuclear arms race began during World War II as German and American scientists were racing to be the first to develop nuclear weapons. While the German effort was hampered by the lack of resources and scientists, the American effort was relatively well funded and centralized under the Manhattan Project. Under the Manhattan Project, the United States pursued two nuclear technologies. The first was a gun-type fission codenamed Little Boy that essentially used a gun to shoot uranium-235 into more U-235, causing a chain reaction. This was the bomb technology used in Hiroshima in August 1945. The second technology developed under the Manhattan Project was an implosion-based device codenamed Fat Man. This was the bomb used over Nagasaki. The implosion-based devices essentially used a controlled explosion within a core to force fissible material, in this case plutonium, in on itself, compressing it to a critical mass which in turn explodes. In both cases, the explosion is actually generated by a process called nuclear fission, that is, splitting of an atom, or really lots of atoms, into smaller fragments by neutrons. The freed neutron strikes the nucleus of an atom, like uranium-235 or plutonium-239, which causes two or three neutrons from that atom to be knocked free. Energy is released by those neutrons split off from the nucleus. Those freed neutrons strike other uranium or plutonium nuclei, splitting off some of their neutrons and so on. The energy released can be enormous. The Hiroshima bomb used less than one kilogram of U-235 to release energy equal to approximately 15,000 tons of TNT, while the Nagasaki bomb used a little more than one kilogram of P-239 to release the destructive energy equal to about 21,000 tons of TNT. After World War II, nuclear technology continued to evolve as scientists developed nuclear fusion technology. Unlike fission, which releases energy when unstable radioactive isotopes split, fusion generates energy as two smaller atoms, usually hydrogen or hydrogen isotopes, combine to form larger atoms, usually helium isotopes. This is the same process by which the sun generates its energy. Because they rely on hydrogen and require high temperatures to ignite the process of nuclear fusion, these bombs are sometimes called hydrogen bombs or thermonuclear bombs. The first hydrogen bomb was detonated by the United States over the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific on November 1, 1952. The bomb had the explosive equivalent of about 10 megatons, that is 10 million tons of TNT. The Soviet Union detonated their first hydrogen bomb less than a year later. The Soviet development of nuclear weapons technology ended the American nuclear monopoly and did so much more quickly than the U.S. thought was possible at the time. At the end of World War II, the United States possessed a monopoly on nuclear weapons in the world. That monopoly lasted just four years as the Soviets detonated their first atomic bomb in August 1949. The Soviet development of nuclear technology forced the United States to abandon its nuclear strategy. How and under what conditions would the United States use nuclear weapons? And what should American foreign policy during the Cold War look like more broadly? The earliest answers to the second question came from George Kennan, the U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union. In a famous article entitled The Sources of Soviet Conduct, published under the pseudonym X, and long referred to as the X article, Kennan argues in favor of a policy of long-term, patient but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies. More broadly, this policy came to be known as containment. Kennan's containment had three broad goals, each supported by a specific technique. First, it sought the reestablishment of a balance of power to maintain international peace. Specifically, Kennan believed that the ultimate goal of U.S. foreign policy should not be the division of the world into American and Soviet spheres of influence, but rather the promotion of independent centers of power in Europe and Asia. Kennan believed that such independent power centers would provide natural checks on Soviet expansion. This would be achieved, according to Kennan, by encouraging self-confidence in nations threatened by Soviet expansion. 
This can be seen in specific policies like martial aid programming and other long-term U.S. military and foreign aid programs. Second, Kennan argued in favor of reducing the Soviet Union's ability to project power outside of its own borders. This would most immediately be achieved by exploiting tensions within the Soviet sphere of influence, essentially a policy of divide and conquer. We see this in American efforts to improve relations with some communist countries like Tito and Yugoslavia, or later in improving relations with communist China. Kennan believed that nationalism would prove more durable than communism, and supporting nationalist efforts inside communist states would naturally reduce support for Soviet expansion. And third, Kennan sought to move the USSR away from universalistic expressions of a monolithic communist foreign policy in favor of more grounded, particularist understandings that permitted exchange and bargaining. This element of Kennan's policy is probably furthest from the actual implementation of the policy of containment by U.S. policymakers. The doctrine of containment became one of the cornerstones of American foreign policy during the Cold War. Its earliest expression can be seen in the Truman Doctrine of 1947, which explicitly argued in favor of U.S. support for anti-communist movements and which led to U.S. support for such forces in Greece and Turkey. The idea of containment essentially contended that the United States should seek to establish a cordon around the Soviet Union and its allies and prevent them from breaking through that cordon. Many U.S. foreign policy decisions during the Cold War can be seen through this lens. The U.S. intervened in Korea and Vietnam to prevent Soviet expansion in Asia. It did the same in Latin America and largely for the same reasons. Indeed, this policy was closely connected to the idea of the domino theory. That is, if the United States permitted Vietnam to fall, next would be Japan or the Philippines, then India or Indonesia, and ultimately the United States itself. Thus, the U.S. had to intervene to prop up allies to prevent this from happening. But seen from the Soviet perspective, U.S. support, including military support for its allies in Europe, Turkey, and across Southern Asia, Southeast Asia, and into Japan, represented a threat of capitalist encirclement. That is, that the United States was seeking to surround the Soviet Union by establishing multiple lines for attack into the country. From the Soviet perspective, the logic was thus clear. The Soviets should try to break through the capitalist encirclement. While the broad American strategy during the Cold War was based on the idea of containment, nuclear politics necessitated its own strategic views, and American and indeed Soviet nuclear thinking changed over time during the Cold War. The earliest explicit nuclear strategy on the part of the United States was the doctrine of massive retaliation, first articulated by Secretary of State John Foster Dulles in 1954. According to Dulles, we need allies and collective security. Our purpose is to make these relations more effective, less costly. This can be done by placing more reliance on deterrent power and less dependence on local defensive power. Local defense will always be important, but there's no local defense which alone will contain the mighty land power of the communist world. Local defenses must re be reinforced by the further deterrent of massive retaliatory power. A potential aggressor, read here the Soviet Union, must know that he cannot always prescribe the battle conditions that suit him. Dulles asserted that the United States would respond to military provocation at times and places and with means of our own choosing. Massive retaliation was articulated in the context of growing fear and perception that the Soviet Union presented a conventional military threat to Europe that the United States could not hope to counter simply with conventional forces. To that end, President Eisenhower believed that reliance on nuclear threat would permit the United States to reduce its own conventional force commitment to European allies while still maintaining a realistic threat of retaliation against Soviet aggression. The massive retaliation doctrine suffered from a couple of significant limits. First, it's not clear that a nuclear response to a conventional threat would have been followed through, particularly given the counterstrike potential it would certainly provoke by the USSR. And second, it reinforced Soviet perceptions of an aggressive U.S. policy keen on making widespread use of nuclear weapons. Remember that just a few years earlier, the United States had actually used nuclear weapons on Japan, making it the only country in the world to do so. The U.S. was now saying that it would readily use them on the Soviet Union as well. Ironically, remember back to the security dilemma, 
The massive retaliation doctrine may have sped up Soviet efforts to expand their own nuclear stockpiles and technologies. The American nuclear strategy of massive retaliation held so long only as two conditions were met. First, that the United States had a nuclear monopoly that prevented a Soviet nuclear response, and second, that the United States was actually willing to use nuclear weapons in response to a conventional Soviet attack. In practice, neither of these axioms held true. Indeed, the American nuclear monopoly was short-lived. The U.S. possessed two nuclear weapons in 1945 and 299 by 1950. American stockpiles continued to grow into the 1960s when advances in targeting and missile accuracy permitted the United States to reduce the number of warheads it possessed. The Soviet Union, for its part, continued to grow its nuclear forces, relying on sheer numbers rather than accuracy as part of its military strategy. At its peak, in the mid-1980s, the Soviet Union maintained a stockpile of nearly 40,000 warheads. The other nuclear powers never kept pace. The United Kingdom secured the nuclear bomb in 1952 and its peak maintained about 500 warheads. Today it has about 250. France became a nuclear power in 1960 and developed initially a stockpile of about 500 warheads, but by the early 1990s, uh, today it's down to about 300. China secured the nuclear weapon in 1964 and gradually expanded its warhead stockpile to its current levels of about 250. These five countries are the five permanent members of the Security Council and are the only recognized nuclear powers under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. That said, several other countries have nuclear weapons today. Israel developed their weapon in the early 1970s and has a stockpile and estimated to be about 80 warheads. Uh, India developed theirs in 1974 and has about 100 warheads. Pakistan developed their nuclear weapon in the early 1980s and also has about 100 or 110 warheads. Uh, and North Korea detonated its first warhead in 2006 and today has an estimated six to eight nuclear warheads. And South Africa has perhaps the most interesting history of nuclear weapons. It developed nuclear weapons technologies in the early 1980s and maintained that stockpile of about six warheads until the country voluntarily disclosed its nuclear program and dismantled its missiles, making it the only country in the world to develop and then dismantle its own nuclear weapons program. Now, as Soviet nuclear stockpiles continued to grow, the U.S. increasingly realized that its doctrine of massive retaliation wouldn't actually deter Soviet behavior. The 1963 Cuban Missile Crisis showed that the USSR would continue to secure its own interests, and the threat of nuclear retaliation would not dissuade them from that. As a result, the U.S. switched its nuclear policy from a doctrine of massive retaliation to a doctrine of flexible response. The idea of flexible response was that the United States would maintain a sufficiently flexible military posture that would allow it to respond to Soviet aggression through both conventional and nuclear means. Conventional forces, particularly in Europe, would be maintained both as a deterrent against Soviet aggression and to permit the United States the capacity to fight a limited military engagement there. The flexible response doctrine depended on the maintenance of a nuclear triad, that is, a combination of land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, sea-based submarine-launched ballistic missiles, or SLBMs, and strategic bombers. The idea of the triad was that each should independently be able to impose unacceptable damage on the Soviet Union. If two of the triad legs were destroyed, the third could still retaliate. Each leg of the triad also compensated for the weakness of the others. Strategic bombers were vulnerable and less airborne, but could be recalled if a strike was called off. ICBMs were more secure, but were also vulnerable to a Soviet first strike. SLBMs were hidden, but submarines could be difficult to communicate with, and the missile they carried were generally less accurate than their land-based counterparts. The doctrine of flexible response also differentiated between types of targets embodied in different war strategies. Counterforce targeted the opponent's military industrial infrastructure in an effort to undermine their capacity to conduct war. This could be done primarily by the use of strategic bombers and ICBM forces. As the Cold War moved on, missiles became smaller and increasingly accurate in an effort to promote usable, quote unquote, nuclear forces. In the 1960s, most nuclear weapons were, the si were in the multi-megaton range, but by the 1980s, they had decreased in size to less than one megaton. At the same time, the total number of weapons increased dramatically. Counter-value strategy targeted opponents' population centers, mostly cities. 
This was the true heart of the idea of deterrence, making war too costly to fight. Countervalue was the original primary mission of SLBM, or submarine-launched forces. It is also characteristic of nuclear forces that are less accurate but larger in megatonnage. Most countries with relatively small nuclear arsenals, like China or North Korea, maintain what's often referred to as a minimum countervalue deterrence force. But even in a limited counterforce strategy employed by the United States or Russia would result in millions of civilian deaths. Indeed, a 2019 study concluded that counterforce exchange between the U.S. And, the, and Russia would likely still result in more than 10 million civilian deaths on each side. And of course, in practice, the difference between the two strategies was fuzzy, as many military installations are located close to the civilian population centers and vice versa. The counter-value strategy was rooted in a doctrine referred to as Mutually Assured Destruction, or MAD. Officially, MAD emerged at the end of the Kennedy administration. MAD held that American nuclear forces should be sufficiently large and protected to survive a Soviet first strike and to be able to respond to that strike. In doing so, it would dissuade the Soviets from launching any first strike. The logic also applied in reverse, preventing an American first strike. This standoff was sometimes called deterrence theory, and it's often credited with being the reason there was never a direct military conflict between the U.S. and the USSR during the Cold War. But MAD depend on a perverse balance of terror. Each side must remain vulnerable to the other side's ability to destroy it in a second strike. While SLBMs were generally viewed as the source of this threat, advances in military technology during the Cold War threatened to undermine this strategic balance. Anti-ballistic missile systems were frequently presented as a defensive system intended to protect the deploying country from missile attack by the other. But seen from the perspective of MAD, anti-ballistic missile systems, or ABMs, actually threatened to undermine the strategic stability and incentivize a first strike posture. By presenting the possibility that one side could shield itself from the other, the incentive not to strike first was reduced. In the 1960s, both the U.S. and the USSR were developing ABM systems. Recognizing the potentially destabilizing nature of these systems, the U.S. and the USSR signed the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in 1972. Under that treaty, each country was limited to de developing no more than 100 anti-ballistic missiles, defending only one city. The Soviets deployed their ABM system around Moscow, while the United States abandoned its system altogether. In the 1980s, Ronald Reagan sought to pursue a nationwide missile defense system, the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI, or sometimes called Star Wars. The Soviets objected to this, that it was a violation of the ABM treaty. The United States maintained because it was a laser-based system in space, it did not violate the 100 anti-ballistic missile limit and therefore was permitted. In either case, the United States withdrew from the ABM treaty in 2001. At the time, President George W. Bush cited the threat posed by rogue nuclear states like North Korea. The Russians responded by increasing their nuclear stockpiles. MIRV, or Multiple Independently Targeted Reentry Vehicles, also presented a threat to the MAD doctrine. MIRV missiles placed multiple nuclear warheads on a single rocket. The U.S. Peacekeeper missile, for example, could hold up to 10 warheads, each with a yield of about 300 kilotons of TNT, or about 230 Hiroshima-type bombs. MIRV weapons made a first strike more attractive because destroying a single missile on the ground reduced the opponent's capacity to respond up to tenfold. Again, both sides recognized the destabilizing impact of these weapon systems, and the START II, or the Strategic Arms Reduction Talk Treaty, was supposed to limit their deployment. However, this treaty never came into force as Russia withdrew from that treaty in response to American withdrawal from the ABM Treaty a year earlier. The spread of nuclear weapons and the pressure to use them or lose them, that is, to maintain a strong retaliatory posture in the event of a nuclear strike by your opponent, meant that both sides watched the other for possible use of nuclear weapons necessitating a response. Both sides were on a hair trigger, and there were a significant number of nuclear close calls throughout the Cold War period. On October 5, 1960, a U.S. radar outpost in Greenland misinterpreted a moonrise over Norway as a large-scale Soviet launch, prompting NORAD to go on high alert. Only the fact that Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev was in New York for a meeting of the United Nations led to a questioning of the launch detection and led to the Americans to stand down. <laughs> 
On January 24, 1961, an American B-52 heavy bomber carrying three nuclear bombs suffered a mid-air disaster and broke up over North Carolina, dropping its nuclear payload in the process. A report declassified in 2013 showed that the bombs came very close to detonating. On November 24, 1961, American Strategic Air Command, or SAC, headquarters lost communications with NORAD and a large number of ballistic missile early warning sites. These sites were intended to operate independently, so loss of communication with so many of them at once was interpreted as a result of a Soviet-coordinated first strike. SAC ordered the launch of all nuclear bomber forces, but that order was rescinded after it was discovered that the loss of communication was the result of the loss of a, a power to a single communication relay facility. On October 27, 1962, at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, a Soviet patrol submarine interpreted the dropping of depth, practice depth charges by the USS Beale as a real attack against the submarine. Unable to confirm with Moscow, the crew prepared to launch its 10 kiloton nuclear torpedo against the American fleet. The Soviet submarine commander, Vasily Arkhipov, goes against orders and refuses to launch the torpedo without confirmation from Moscow, likely, present, likely preventing a full-scale nuclear war. On November 9, 1965, the command center of the Office of Emergency Planning went on full alert after a massive power outage in the northeastern United States was misinterpreted to be the result of a Soviet nuclear attack instead of a malfunctioning circuit error. On May 23, 1967, a Soviet flare interfered with NORAD radar, leaving American military commanders to believe that the Soviet Union was jamming American radar to blind it to a Soviet first strike. American policymakers ordered U.S. nuclear bombers to launch for a retaliatory strike against the Soviet Union. The order was rescinded once it was determined that it was a solar flare and not a Soviet first strike that was jamming American radar. On November 9, 1979, during the Yom Kippur War, NORAD detected an initial Soviet launch of 250 ballistic missiles, followed immediately by the launch of another 2,200 missiles. A decision to launch a retaliatory strike had been made within seven minutes, or American missiles would be destroyed on the ground. Bombers were scrambled, and the decision to launch American nuclear missiles was being made. Six minutes after the initial detection of a Soviet launch, one minute before the U.S. decision had to be made, it was determined that a war training program had accidentally been loaded into an operational computer. Remember the plot of the movie War Games? In the following months, there were three similar false detections of Soviet launches. On March 15, 1980, a Soviet submarine test-launched four missiles as part of a training scenario. American early warning sensors indicated that one of the missiles was targeting the United States. A threat assessment discounted the likelihood of a Soviet attack and no counterattack was ordered. On September 23, 1983, a Soviet early warning system detected the launch of six American Minuteman missiles against targets in the Soviet Union. Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov, who was responsible for monitoring American launches, refused to order a Soviet retaliatory strike until computer reports could be independently verified by Soviet ground radar, likely present preventing the outbreak of World War III. And if you want to see a great movie about him, check out The Man Who Saved the World on Netflix. Unless you think that the post-Cold War environment reduced the likelihood of close calls, on January 25, 1995, Russian monitoring stations detected the launch of a Norwegian research satellite studying the Northern Lights and misinterpreted that launch as an American nuclear strike. Russian President Boris Yeltsin activated Russia's nuclear briefcase in preparation to order a retaliatory strike until it was communicated that the launch was a satellite, not a nuclear missile. And the list that I've provided you here isn't even complete. It's American-centric because the U.S. essentially declassifies material more quickly than the Soviet Union or Russia did, and we know more about American close calls than Soviets or others. It also doesn't include, for example, the more than 30 times a nuclear weapon was lost, stolen, or accidentally detonated. There are at least six nuclear warheads today that we still can't find. It also doesn't include the 181 times the International Atomic Energy Agency has caught someone trying to smuggle nuclear weapons grade material across an international border since 1992. All of these close calls led to pressure to reduce the hair trigger on which both countries kept their nuclear arsenals.
protocol to inform one another of test launches and space launches, direct lines of communications between leaders, the red phones you see in movies, uh, and efforts to reduce the size and control the nature of nuclear weapons were undertaken. Indeed, there were other efforts intended to limit the development, deployment, and proliferation of nuclear weapons around the world. A number of rounds of treaties between the U.S. and the USSR, all of which limited the number of weapons on both sides, were signed during the Cold War. The Strategic Arm Limitation Talks, which is actually two separate treaties, start SALT I and SALT II, were signed in the 1970s and limited the number of missiles on each side. The Strategic Arms Reduction Treaties, START I and START II, were signed in, 19, in the 1990s and early 2000s with the same goals. Already mentioned, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty limited each side's deployment of protective missile systems intended to maintain the balance of terror. The Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, or INF Treaty, signed in 1988, was the first international treaty to completely ban one class of nuclear missiles. Recognizing that land-based, short-range nuclear weapons were particularly destabilizing, the U.S. and the USSR agreed to eliminate them altogether, thus eliminating a total of 2,692 warheads. The treaty remained in force until 2019, when the U.S. formally withdrew, citing Russian treaty violations. At the global rather than the bilateral level, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, or CTBT, bans all nuclear explosions. The treaty was initially signed in 1996 and today has 184 signatories and 168 ratifiers. Among those still needing to ratify the treaty are China, India, Iran, Israel, North Korea, Pakistan, the United States. The treaty has generally been a success as only three countries, India, Pakistan, and North Korea, have tested nuclear weapons since the treaty entered into force. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, or NPT, was signed in 1968 and has 190 parties. The most important non-parties being India, Israel, North Korea, Pakistan, and South Sudan. The NPT has two key provisions. First, it obliges non-nuclear weapon states, that is, signatories to the treaty outside of the United States, Russia, France, the United Kingdom, and China, to agree to not pursue nuclear weapons technologies. And it obliges the nuclear weapons state, those five states listed previously, to agree to pursue complete and total nuclear disarmament in good faith and at the earliest possible date. It also guarantees the rights of states to pursue nuclear technology for peaceful purposes like energy generation or medical testing. Despite limited proliferation, the NPT is widely viewed to be a successful international agreement. Before its enactment, there were projections that as many as 30 nuclear weapon states could exist by 1990. Instead, there are just nine. So that concludes our consideration of Cold War and nuclear politics in international relations. Be sure to check out the other videos in this series. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.